setup, uh, multi-camera setup. There's one camera here on me, and as you'll see here shortly, uh, thanks to my producer uh, Michael in the background, we have another camera on the limb itself here, so you can get a close-up when uh, I start cutting away here. So this will let you get a good close-up view of the action. So it promises to be an exciting program, and I'm really glad you all have joined, uh, joined us today. So go ahead in the comments, let us know, you know where you're watching from. If you have any questions, uh, Michael, our producer, uh, behind the scenes here, will read them out uh, if any come up. So uh, go ahead, I, I can't see them. So if I don't respond immediately, we'll do our best to get to as many as we can today. First off, uh, before we get into all this, if you like the video today, go ahead and uh, press the like button. Uh, we'd really appreciate it and share it around to your friends, tell people about it. Uh, we really appreciate it. And if you want to take your support to the next level, consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Your membership uh, supports programming like this for as low as $25 a year, you get free admission to our location here at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, and you support all this cool tech uh, that we're going to be using today and really trying to showcase uh, our program today. So hit share and hit like. Great, easy, free way to support us and become a member if you want to step up your support to the next level. So with all that said, We'll go ahead and get into our, uh, our program today. So what happens if you're a casualty during the Civil War? Uh, well, it depends an awful lot on when you're injured. In the beginning of the Civil War, so I, I imagine a lot of you out there watching might, when you think about Civil War medicine, uh, imagine some pretty gruesome uh, circumstances, conditions, you know, generally not very good. Well, that was especially the case in the war's uh, early years, the, the first uh, year of the war. For example, at the first major battle of the Civil War, the Battle of First Bull Run, there are about 5,000 casualties in that battle, and there's no such thing as the Ambulance Corps at that time. There's no dedicated system to get wounded soldiers off the battlefield and into hospitals. So some soldiers lay on the battlefield for five to seven days waiting for medical care, which is, of course, a disaster. Uh, you can't help people that you can't see, um, that the, the doctors don't get a chance to you know, get in front of them. Uh, so it's apparent almost immediately that there is a problem, uh, you know, that there's something needs to change. Uh, there needs to be a dedicated system designed to care for wounded soldiers from the moment they're injured all the way through to long-term recovery. And that system is brought about uh, by this gentleman here. This is Jonathan Letterman. And I'll show you a close-up on this other camera here. This is Jonathan Letterman. Uh, he becomes the medical director of the Union Army of the Potomac in 1862. Uh, and Letterman is the person that comes up with the Ambulance Corps in the uh, summer of 1862 in August, a dedicated group of uh, trained individuals designed to remove wounded soldiers from the battlefield, get them into field hospitals. The Ambulance Corps debuts at the Battle of Antietam, uh, fought September 17th, 1862, the bloodiest single day in American history. 23,000 casualties in a single day. Uh, and within 24 hours of the end of the battle, all wounded soldiers are off the field and in field hospitals. So the Ambulance Corps is a huge success. Also debuting at the Battle of Antietam is what's very originally called the Letterman Plan or the Letterman System. And that's where we start to get into some of this stuff here on the table. The Letterman Plan is a system of care, the skeleton of which we still use today in our military. It's one way that Civil War medicine still impacts us and benefits us today. So it's a three-tiered system designed to care for a wounded soldier from the moment they're injured all the way through long-term recovery. And that begins with this here at something called the field dressing station. This is step one of the Letterman plan. Now the main purpose of this, this is uh, set up by two assistant surgeons close behind the lines such that wounded soldiers don't have to go very far to get to care, uh, but far enough away and ideally in a sheltered area, you'll notice I say ideally, 
Civil War battles and mass casualty situations are frequently not ideal, so that's not always possible. But ideally, it should be in a, a, a sheltered area such that the wounded soldiers shouldn't be uh, in danger of being shot again, perhaps behind some rocks or one field dressing station at the battlefield at Antietam was behind some hay bales uh, or any structures that might be there. So there's this can take a number of different shapes and sizes where this is located. But again, it's quite close to the front lines. And in this, so this is a portable field dressing kit. And there are a slew of different kinds of these that, they, that were made. We have several on display here in the museum in our field dressing station gallery. Uh, but they're all designed to be portable. There are some backpack straps on this. Uh, I'm not going to put it on for you, A, because it's incredibly uncomfortable, uh, but it's portable. That's the most important thing, and it's quite heavy. Um, in these field dressing kits, and this is sort of the spiritual predecessor of our modern first aid kits. Uh, depending on where you are, if you're in a public place right now, uh, odds are you're not too far away from a first aid kit right now. Again, uh, Civil War medicine, the kind of uh, distant descendant of Civil War medicine still benefiting us today. Inside the Civil War equivalent of this, you will find any number of things, some sort of medicines. We've got morphine uh, and such here. Uh, in some of these other compartments, we have bandages to bind up uh, soldiers' wounds, uh, tourniquets in order to stop the flow of bleeding. And all of these get to the most important job of those at the field dressing station, stop the bleeding. From there, once the bleeding has been stopped, they perform triage. This is the first time triage is officially uh, instituted in American medical history, uh, in uh, American military medical history. They're prioritizing the wounded based on severity of injury. Uh, now today, we prioritize those with head and chest injuries because we want our brain, our heart, and our lungs to continue doing the things that they need to do to keep us alive. At the time of the Civil War, invasive surgery isn't quite where it needs to be to consistently uh, help people with those sorts of injuries. So they're going to prioritize those with limb injuries, uh, hence the leg. Well, don't worry, everyone. We're going to get to the leg uh, before too long here. So the, those with limb injuries would be prioritized. They would be the first to go on the ambulances of the ambulance corps, which ideally should be waiting by the field dressing station. And again, here's another example of where we see the Letterman plan still in action and benefiting us today. If you've ever been to a large outdoor gathering, a county fair, uh, outdoor concert or sporting event or something like this, you've probably seen the white medical tent with the Red Cross. And often there is an ambulance waiting right next to that. That is directly from the mind of Jonathan Letterman because it's a great idea. Uh, if you're injured and you need to seek medical attention, you might need to quickly get to the hospital. Uh, and so that's why they set it up the way they do, and that comes from the Civil War era. So once the uh, wounded soldiers have been placed on the ambulances of the ambulance corps, they would be sent to the next part of the Letterman plan, which is the field hospital. The field hospital, ideally, should be a mile or two behind the lines or so, such that, again, wounded soldiers don't have to go very far to get medical care but uh, far enough away from the battlefield that we shouldn't have to worry about cannonballs flying through. That wasn't always the case. That did happen sometimes. Sometimes you can't predict how a battle's gonna go and sometimes field hospitals would be overrun. Uh, that's just a nature of not knowing how the future will turn out. Uh, it's just part of the human condition. But so there's a lot of thought that is put in by the medical officers trying to identify locations to uh, put a field hospital. Sometimes they don't have much choice. Sometimes there just aren't many structures around a battlefield and beggars can't be choosers, which is why it's very common for a field hospital to be in a place like a barn. Now, a barn is far from a sterile environment to be performing major surgery like I'm about to do here. Um, but again, beggars can't be choosers. And the critical thing that is worth noting, I'll reiterate this a few times, is that we don't know about germ theory yet uh, during the Civil War. We're about 10 years away from the discovery of that. So as I uh, perform surgery here, just know that uh, me as the surgeon, I'm not going to be washing my hands at any point before, during, or after this procedure. So just file that one away. We'll revisit that. Now, once the ambulance gets to the field hospital, we see our patient here. 
and he could be wounded by one of any number of things. First off, uh, he could have been wounded by artillery. We have this. This is a, exactly what it looks like. It is a cannonball, and I'll hold this here under the other, uh, the other camera here. This is a literal cannonball. It would be referred to as solid shot. So this is just a 10-pound ball of iron that would be shot out of cannons. And if you're struck by this, you likely won't make it back to the field hospital, or perhaps it'll do the amputation for you. I was just talking with a colleague uh, earlier today that uh, a pseudo amputation was performed at the Battle of Antietam. Uh, there was a Union soldier by Burnside Bridge saw a, a solid shot like I was just showing there bouncing along. Uh, and it didn't appear to be going very fast and he foolishly stuck his foot out and poof, there goes his foot along with the uh, cannonball. So um, very deadly uh, type of projectile. And if you get struck by this, uh, an amputation probably isn't in the cards for you. Now, something like this is a little bit more deadly and damaging. This is what's known as, uh, or at least a portion of case shot or shell. Uh, it, would, it was a hollow version of what I was just showing you earlier. Uh, an artillery projectile, a spherical shell filled with gunpowder designed to explode either on impact with the ground uh, or in the air with a timed fuse. And bits of this, uh, shards of iron, would come raining down or rocketing out uh, to nearby infantry. And uh, depending on where you were hit by this, this could of course be insanely deadly, um, but also very damaging and might need might lead you to need uh, an amputation. So that's another type of ammunition that could uh, put a Civil War soldier in, uh, in a hospital. Um, and I see Michael mentioning uh, we have a question from the audience here. Yes, um, there was a good one that came up kind of around the same time you were talking about that. So um, Tony Pitor Sr., I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, um, he asked if surgeons pour whiskey on wounds during surgery with that slow infection. Uh, that's a great question, Tony, about uh, whiskey and infection. So uh, as I mentioned, they don't know about germ theory. So they are using whiskey and such, and, and we're going to get to what they use for uh, an anesthetic in just a little bit here. Uh, great question about, about the whiskey. It is being used in the surgical process, uh, but uh, after the procedure is done as a stimulant. That's how they think of, of whiskey at the time of the Civil War, not as a, the depressant that we know it to be today, uh, but they're using it as a stimulant, that kind of burning sensation you get in your chest, you know, especially when you, when you drink liquor. They see that as that has like an enervating quality that energizes somebody, um, or they might give it to a soldier for shock, but they're not giving it um, in... Uh, in antiseptic kind of way, as, as you're suggesting. They're, it's just not in their frame of reference. They don't know that it has that quality um, to it. So they're not using it in that way, and they're not us using it as an anesthetic either. Um, we're going to get to that in just a second. But that's a great question. Finally, the most common um, type of ammunition that would receive, uh, that would give soldiers injuries is this. This is a mini ball. Uh, or a Civil War bullet, uh, named after French uh, manufacturer Claude Minier. Uh, this was the most common type of projectile that would put a Civil War soldier in a hospital. Now, this is a, a lead bullet, and when this strikes human bone, it's not going to just break the bone, it's going to shatter the bone. Now today, we can deal with um, shattered bones, at the time, that's a little bit more challenging uh, for them in the Civil War era. So today, if you have a, a fracture or a clean break, you basically put a cast on your arm or your leg and you know don't bang it into a wall and it kind of put, puts itself back together. Uh, and here feels like an appropriate time to say that I am not a doctor. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but I do play one uh, on the internet uh, in this case. Um, but the, the human body is pretty remarkable. Um, and they have splints in the, Civil War era, in the Civil War era. They know how to set broken bones, but a shattered bone is just a little bit beyond their skill to heal. Today, you know, pins and screws and plates, and there's all manner of things that, that can be done to help uh, a shattered bone put itself back together. At the time, they don't have the capability to deal with that. And so, uh, amputation is most often what's called for. And amputations happen at field hospitals, which getting us back to the Letterman plan, that's step two 
of the Letterman system. Now, the uh, surgeons would, would gather around and so now we're gonna turn to the actual surgery here. So as you can see, uh, he's been uh, our, our poor disembodied leg here, uh, who is a soldier. <laughs> he's been shot here in the leg, you can see. Um, we have a, a bullet protruding here. So the very first thing that they would do before we do anything is we're gonna put a tourniquet on. You might've been wondering what this is. The purpose of this, you tighten this, which really will then constrict the flow of blood to this portion of the leg. It'll give the leg that sensation that, you know, you know, like when your leg falls asleep or you, you sit on it wrong and you get that tingling sensation. That's what we're going for here so that um, it'll be a little bit desensitized and critically blood will not flow to this area of the body any longer. So when we start cutting, I mean, there'll be a certain amount of blood in the leg itself. Uh, but once we start cutting, an amputation is actually not as bloody of a procedure as you might think. So step one, we've got the, uh, the tourniquet on. Step two is to administer our anesthesia, and that is chloroform in this case, or ether. Um, but today, I'll be using chloroform in this uh, empty bottle, never fear. Um, so chloroform and ether uh, are used as the anesthesia of choice in 95% of all Civil War surgeries. The overwhelming majority of Civil War surgery uses anesthesia. It's the rule and not the exception. And it would be administered using either something like this, a little cone with a rag in there, just a few drops, only the equivalent of um, about half a shot glass. You don't need a whole lot to uh, induce the uh, state of anesthesia. So a little bit into this cone, which would be placed over the patient's mouth, or um, what was actually more common than, than this device here was literally just a rag. Um, so it's, it's pretty low tech, but it is effective. So our patient has been given the tourniquet here. They've been put to sleep using uh, anesthesia, chloroform here. Now to get on with the procedure. And the first thing to do, so here the bullet is visible here, uh, but if the bullet was further down inside the patient, the surgeon would first wanna locate the bullet and try and extract it, just to ensure that in the course of cutting away, we don't bump into it anywhere and cause any further complications. Um, and if we couldn't see it, the surgeon would literally just take their finger and just kind of fish around uh, in, the, in the wound there to try and find it. But we can see it here, so they'll take this. This is a bullet extractor, uh, and the purpose of this is quite obvious. We uh, get a hold of the bullet here and we take it out. There we are, so we'll set aside the bullet. Um, there we are, so we've We've taken care of that. Now the next step, now the amputation procedure that I'm about to go through here in many ways has not changed a whole lot in the you know, subsequent 150 years. The procedure that we still do today uh, bears a lot of resemblance to what they did during the Civil War. There are a lot of important differences, of course. We know about germ theory. We have, you know, as opposed to a hand saw, which we're gonna get to later, uh, you know, we have something more powered. There's a lot of important differences, but the general idea of the procedure is the same. And this is one example of how it has not changed at all. We're using this tool next. This is a scalpel. This is used every single day by surgeons around the world, uh, not always for amputations, but, uh, but just to make incisions. The purpose of this tool is simply to break the skin. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So we just cut through the skin here. That's the main thing. Now, I'm sure some of you are saying to, yourself, uh, to yourselves, John, this doesn't seem very realistic. You're literally rotating this leg 360 degrees. That seems unlikely like it would have happened in the Civil War. Uh, you would be correct <laughs> to, to note that. Um, uh, I have the benefit, obviously, of doing this, but a surgery, uh, a amputation procedure would be done by a minimum of two surgeons. Now, again, in a mass casualty situation, um, that's not always possible, but a surgeon, you need at least two surgeons. The preference would be for three, one to administer the anesthesia and kind of hold the patient down because, and I should have said this earlier, they're giving low doses of anesthesia because they don't want to overdose with that. And there are Thankfully, not many recorded instances of that happening, um, only in about uh, less than 1% of all surgeries are pretty good about that. Um, but one 
but, but because the dosage is so low, there can sometimes be some movement by the patient. And so there's one person to administer the anesthesia and kind of hold the shoulders down. And then one person doing the cutting and then one person to kind of articulate the leg up or down uh, as needed. So we've cut through the skin, very good. Um, now comes this knife. This is what's called a Catlin knife. Uh, and the purpose of this is to cut through muscles and ligaments and other soft tissues. The, uh, and I have multiple different shapes and sizes uh, of this type of knife. A, a Civil War surgeon's toolkit is very versatile. Uh, this is the longest one. I'm going for dramatic effect here. And of course, we are amputating a femur. So this is one of the larger bones in the body that would be amputated. So that's why I'm going with the larger knife. And uh, Michael's signifying we have a question here. Yes. Um, so uh, this is from Kathy. Ooh, hold on. Uh, Kathy Churge. Um, mm -hmm. She's got two questions, but I'm going to save the other one till the end. Okay. Um, this one's pretty good, though. It says, uh, she's asking, can a mini ball left in the body kind of during surgery, can that cause lead poisoning? Uh, that's a good question. And one that we, we get a lot um, about the, because they are, as you said, made out of lead. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, so that did happen sometimes. Sometimes they just couldn't find the bullet. There are instances of bullets being left in soldiers for quite some time. Uh, you know, years and years after the war. I haven't read of many instances or well, any, I haven't read of any instances of lead poisoning or some especially damaging effects due to leaving a bullet in the body. I mean, I'm sure it's not good for the person. I'm, I'm sure it's not, you know, improving their health <laughs> on, on a daily basis. But I haven't myself, I haven't personally run across any instances where it's been especially damaging. Um, so that's, that's the best answer I, I have there. Uh, great question. Thank you, Kathy. So uh, moving with our soft tissue knife here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and build on the incision made by the scalpel. Actually, and, if you want to um, kind of, as you keep going, there's another good, good question if you want to sure. answer it in the middle. So Please. we've got, um, I think it's Jan Kavorak um, asks, do most surgeons leave skin flaps while they're oh. getting into it? Thank you, Jan. You reminded me of one of my favorite parts of this program, asking about skin flaps. Uh, yes is the answer, and something I should have done earlier. So um, I can't really demonstrate on this, but um, what they would do is when they make the incision with the scalpel, they would literally kind of peel back a layer of skin, just as you might rolling up a shirt sleeve, something like that. They just kind of peel it back a little bit such that once the procedure is over, then it gets rolled back down and over. Thank you so much, Jan, for bringing that up. That's a pivotal part of this whole uh, procedure. And I've so, got one more real fast. Yeah, great, and, please. And, and it's a quick one that we can, I think we can get. Um, Michelle McCoy McCann asked, did, um, how did surgeons clean their tools between surgeries? Ah, great question, uh, Michelle. Uh, if you'll go to the wide shot, Michael, I'll demonstrate. So I've just used this knife to cut through all the muscles and tendons and ligaments. This is how Civil War surgeons would clean their knives. It is clean, <laughs> which we, of course, know it is very much not clean. Um, and, you know, they... I, I kid a little bit, but they probably, you know, they might have used a rag and, and maybe they would have even kind of dumped it in, a, in some water, um, but not a thorough cleaning by our standards. They're just wiping the appearance of blood off of the blade. So we have now uh, used the soft tissue knife. And by this point, um, the surgeon would, the only thing holding this leg together now is the bone, that's it. And so the surgeon at this point would just kind of move the, uh, the bottom portion of the leg down a little bit so they could get a better angle at the bone in there. So I mean, you can see there is a kind of visible gap here that I have created by kind of moving this down. And they would kind of shimmy the stuff down the bone just, just a little bit to get a little bit better angle to use this tool. Now this is the headliner here. This is the bone saw. Um, this is what comes to mind for many when they think of Civil War medicine. Now again, we have different shapes and sizes of bone saw. This is what might be called a capital saw. Um, because it's the largest one that we have. Uh, again, wouldn't be used in all procedures. We have smaller saws available to us. 
which might be used for, say, a, you know, a finger or even a forearm. Uh, but again, we're going for shock and awe here, dramatic uh, value, so we're using the big saw. So at this point, and by the way, I should note too, I don't know how well this will come across on the stream um, with the, uh, the audio, but we've been told by uh, Civil War or modern surgeons that the sound that this makes when sawing through the bone is not dissimilar from the, uh, the actual sound. Um, so this is about as close as, as you'll get. So you start, you know, just sawing away um, like a, you know, a hacksaw. And if you're a skilled surgeon, oh dear, I'm gonna take the solid shot off the table. I don't want that to roll and smush my foot. All right. And actually along those same lines, another good question about cutting came in from Anita White Green said, did surgeons have a stone or something under the limb or a hard surface they could cut on? Uh, well, they certainly would have a hard surface. I mean, the procedures would be done on some sort of operating table. Oftentimes, uh, a door that they have taken off uh, the hinges. You know, these field hospitals are improvised facilities. So they're just taking whatever they, they can get, a door propped over two barrels uh, or something like this. Um, and as you all can clearly see, I'm not a skilled uh, surgeon here. Um, the fewer strokes you can do this in, the better. Uh, obviously, I've done it I'm in the process of doing it in many strokes, so I'm not a skilled surgeon, which is why I only play a doctor on TV, um, and I'm not an actual doctor. So we're, we're getting along here. And we have, um, there was a few years ago that story where they discovered a limb pit um, and the, the limbs that were cut off, you know, typically were all buried together in mass graves. Uh, and if, well, we'll get to that in a second, but there was a limb pit that was found on the battlefield of Second Bull Run. And we were consulted, we were brought in to kind of consult and shed light on it. Uh, there we go. We finally got the limb off. There's the, uh, there's the procedure done. So let's examine my work as a surgeon. Actually, I was talking about how unskilled of a surgeon I am. Uh, I'm better than I thought. So I don't know how well you can see this, but you'll notice it's a pretty flat edge. Now, um, the, the point I was making about the limb pit at uh, Second Bull Run Battlefield, uh, the limbs that were found there in the, on the sides of the bone, kind of like what I'm showing you here, um, you could actually count the number of saw strokes that the surgeons had used, which is pretty wild. It was something like only five or six. It was pretty brief. I mean, I was going to town there for a while. But another thing that speaks well of me is there's only a tiny little lip there um, where the, uh, the edge of the bone kind of snapped off um, right there. So, but uh, as opposed to the other side of this, which, uh, I or someone else did previously, they were not quite as skilled of a surgeon as I was this time. Um, and again, I'm not sure how well that's coming through. So we take the stump. We don't need this anymore. That's just thrown away and buried somewhere. So along those same lines, see a few, a few people have brought this up. Yes. Um, apparently there is a story coming that Lisa Jackson Billingsley and, who's the other person? Um, and Lynn Epstein both um, are talking about a story about surgeons throwing body parts out the windows of hospitals. Yes, that was a very common occurrence in field hospitals because mass casualty situations, uh, there are sometimes thousands of patients that need to be seen in a single day, uh, and we don't need these limbs anymore, just get them out of the way. Um, and so that was not an uncommon sight, and there are uh, plenty of recorded instances in battles uh, across the, the country where the pile of limbs would raise as high as a first floor uh, window before they were taken away to be buried. So, uh, and if the limbs weren't buried, sometimes uh, the sawed off limbs would be collected by uh, someone by the name of John Brinton. He was the first curator of the Army Medical Museum. And the idea was that these limbs would be collected into the museum's collection, which still exists today as the National Museum of Health and Medicine, which uh, again, quickly isn't us. We are the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. The National Museum of Health and Medicine has thousands of bone samples from the Civil War itself. 
So they were collected for the purpose of learning from the Civil War, and a great book that I would recommend if you're interested in that story, uh, which we sell in our bookstore, both online and uh, in, in the shop here. It's called Learning from the Wounded by Shauna Devine. It's a great book about the history of the Army Medical Museum and what happened to some of those limbs uh, when they were sent off. So very good. We have now uh, cut off the, the limb. So we're, we're done with that. Now we need to start taking precautions to make sure that the patient will have a long, happy, healthy life after the procedure. And for that, our next step is to take this tool. Uh, this is called a tenaculum. And no, this is not a dental tool, although it very closely resembles that. The purpose of the tenaculum is to reach into the kind of end of the stump here, uh, and of course this won't be dramatized very well, but you reach in there and you fish out all of the veins and arteries to make sure that they are properly tied off. Um, because if they're not tied off properly, then blood will pool at the bottom of the stump and the blood won't circulate and make its way back to the heart. So the patient will sort of bleed out after the operation is over, which of course is not good. We don't want that to happen. So when you think of Civil War surgery, I'm gonna guess the word precise doesn't come to mind for a lot of people, but tools like this are very precise. They perform a very specific job and they do it very well. And so we'll take the tenaculum, we'll make sure all the veins and arteries are accounted for, tied off and dealt with appropriately. Next, another very precise tool, this one. This is what's called a bone file. And the purpose of this is to make sure the end of the bone is nice and smooth. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I did a pretty good job, but we'll just file this, file this down just a little bit here, just to make sure it's nice and smooth. We don't want something incredibly sharp poking out um, of the stump on the, uh, the soldier's leg. Again, thinking about the, the future here, if they were to ever wear, say, a prosthetic limb, uh, that pressure on the, you know, the end of the bone could be incredibly uncomfortable. So the purpose is we wanna make this just as smooth as we possibly can. So again, another very precise tool in a Civil War surgeon's toolkit. And continuing that theme, we have this tool here. This is what's called a bone brush. The purpose of this is simply to brush any bone dust uh, out of and away from the wound. Uh, bone dust, um, though very small, um, bone is very hard and we don't want that just kind of rattling around in there in the, in the stump. So we're kind of clearing this off, making sure it's all very clean and clear of any debris that could make a, this person's life uncomfortable. Again, our goal is for this person to have a long, happy and healthy life after this procedure is done. And then finally, we'll sew up the patient with a little needle and thread, good old fashioned needle and thread. And for this, we roll the skin flap back down, we do it over and uh, we sew them up in that manner. Now silk thread is the, uh, the uh, thread of choice for Civil War surgeons in the Union, uh, also preferred in the Confederacy, but silk not always available. And there's a common um, thing that gets brought up. Uh, Confederates would sometimes uh, boil horsehair to make it pliable uh, and use that as thread, which uh, had the uh, unintended consequence of sterilizing the horsehair, uh, which they needed to do in order to make it pliable. So. Um, good news, the flap has been closed and the operation is now complete. You have now witnessed more or less a Civil War uh, amputation here. And of course, we'll, we'll take the tourniquet off as well, loosen that up and, and our patient is uh, in good shape. Uh, yes, another question, Michael. Yeah, um, so, and also one we can kind of tie onto it too. So it looks like, where is it, um, Tony? Pidor mm -hmm. Senior, um, he asked, I think twice, so I missed it the first time, he asked, what was the average time of cutting off the leg? Would you want to go into kind of how long the surgery takes as well on top of that? Yeah, it's a great question. So these procedures, again, I mentioned they're not giving incredibly heavy dosages. Um, these procedures are only taking about 15 minutes on average. Now, I know that seems hilariously short to us today, uh, but that was actually quite long back then. Uh, there were surgeons 
before the advent of anesthesia, which I should note, that came around about 1846, 1847. So by the time the Civil War rolls around, pretty widely accepted. Uh, before the advent of anesthesia, if you were gonna do something like this, you had to do it really quick because without anesthesia, uh, the patient's gonna flail around potentially. Speed is the name of the game. With the advent of anesthesia, speed is now no longer as important. Uh, there were surgeons that would brag that they could perform an amputation in three minutes or less. So 15 minutes is a long time by that metric anyway. Um, doesn't sound terribly long to us today, but yeah, the, these surgeries are happening quite quickly. Now, let's talk a little bit about how likely our disembodied leg soldier here is to survive something like this. So, and again, I'm not a doctor, in case that wasn't already clear. Um, this makes sense to me. The further away from the core of your body the amputation takes place, the more likely you are to survive. It kind of makes sense, right? So if you lose a finger or a toe, you're looking at a two to 4% mortality rate. Not bad, you'll probably be fine all the way up to, if you lose an entire leg at the hip, that was an 83% mortality rate. Now that was so high that some surgeons wouldn't even do the procedure, but just it gives you an idea of the range. If you average it all out, it works out uh, all the 60,000 amputations, I should have mentioned 60,000 total amputations during the Civil War, which works out to about 15,000 a year. This is all you know combined between both sides. If you average it all out, it's about a 26% mortality rate, which is, you know, okay, not bad, but it doesn't sound amazing. It sounds a little bit better when you compare it to the mortality rate for civilian amputations before the Civil War, and that was about 50%. So you're twice as likely to survive an amputation during the Civil War as you would have been before the Civil War. So, and I think that has to do with the Letterman plan working the way it should, quickly getting these people into hospitals. Uh, question, Michael. Yeah, so once you're done with that, um, Barbara Schultz asked how long for an amputee, would an amputee remain in the hospital before they were discharged you know, back out in the wild? A great question. Thank you for that, Barbara. And you're leading me right where I want to go. So once the procedure is done, uh, they will, the soldiers will proceed to the next and final part of the Letterman plan. Now the purpose of the field hospital where we just did this procedure is it's temporary by nature. It's not designed to be, it's not a purpose-built hospital. As I said earlier, many of them are in barns. We don't want to make this a regular you know, place. We, we don't want to stick around here very long. And certainly whoever owns that barn doesn't want you to stick around for very long. So the purpose of a field hospital is to get people in, give them surgery or whatever it is they need and get them out as soon as possible. So as soon as it's physically safe to move them, um, and in some cases, immediately after the surgery, but more often than not, maybe a day, maybe two, um, they'll be sent via either ambulance or preferably by railroad or uh, ship, uh, whatever means necessary to a more permanent purpose-built hospital facility, which is a general hospital, which is where long-term recovery happens. Now, these are located in larger cities, your uh, Philadelphia's, your DC's, your uh, Atlanta's and Richmond's, places like that. Now, there really weren't many large hospitals uh, when the Civil War began. Hospitals were where you went uh, you know, to die, not really to, to get well. Uh, if you needed medical attention, oftentimes the doctors would come to you. So when the Civil War breaks out, the largest military hospital in 1861 only has 40 beds in it, and it's located in Kansas, which of course is not gonna cut it um, for the Civil War, uh, no pun intended. Um, so they set to work very quickly and build large purpose-built hospital facilities that can care for as many as two or 3,000 patients at a time. So uh, long-term recovery happens in these general hospitals, and these general hospitals are where some of the earliest applications of the scientific method in the United States uh, happen in a, on a consistent basis. They're aware, Civil War surgeons are, that diseases spread. Uh, they're aware that, you know, they're not doing things, you know, completely flawlessly. Uh, so they're 
advancing hypotheses, they're testing them out, they're collecting data, it's being recorded. This is how I know a lot of the numbers and factoids have been thrown out at you. They all get recorded in the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. They're all available for free online. Um, unless you're uh, you know, really, really interested, it'll probably put you to sleep immediately, but the data in there is incredible. Um, that, and that allows us to do what we do, basically. So, for example, in these general hospitals, they start to realize that cleanliness is associated with good health. So they require patients be cleaned every single day, their clothes cleaned every single day, and their bed sheets cleaned every single day. Why exactly that is, they don't totally know, but they're in the business of saving lives, so we'll do it. Uh, additionally, they see that airflow seems to be correlated with good health, so they were require the windows be open at all time. And that airflow, um, it, we've been reacquainting ourselves with the, uh, you know, the benefits of airflow uh, in, the, in the days of the pandemic. You know, being outside is more advantageous um, when it comes to COVID, of course. So the, they don't know exactly why this is a thing, but they just require that it be done all the time. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you get some of the goofy things that they try. They're like, hmm, things that smell good tend to be healthier than things that smell bad. So we'll just make it smell good all the time. So they hung greenery and, uh, and, and such pine, uh, pine wreaths and stuff. So if you've ever seen photographs of Civil War hospitals, you might notice all the greenery and you say, huh, I wonder why all photographs of Civil War hospitals were taken around Christmas time. Uh, not necessarily the case. Those, that was kept up year round. Again, if it, you know, a soldier is smelling pine, um, that's not necessarily going to cure them of their typhoid fever, but, you know, they're trying stuff. And even if not all of it worked. So, you know, if you squint, you can see them kind of putting the pieces together. They're getting close to discovering something kind of like germ theory. They realize the importance of cleanliness and airflow and they're getting there, but they don't ultimately get there. But all of these practices produce a very healthy environment. So if you make it to a general hospital, uh, there's only an 8% mortality rate in general hospitals. You have a 92% chance of surviving if you make it to one of those. So that is a major plus. So that is the Letterman system from the field dressing station to the field hospital and then general hospital for long-term recovery. That skeleton is still in use by our military today. Um, again, there are several important differences. We know about germ theory. We have you know, helicopters and motorized vehicles to more efficiently and quickly get uh, wounded, the wounded from point A to point B. There's a lot of important differences, but the structure is still the same and it comes to us directly from the Civil War. So that gives you a bit of an idea of what it would be like if a Civil War soldier was wounded. Uh, questions? Yeah, there was one that kind of went alongside the last one you were doing. Um, you kind of went into support care at large, because I'm, I'm guessing when you say general hospital, that is the larger mm -hmm. style hospitals. Mm -hmm. All right, um, then Chip Jordan kind of asks, uh, was there any artificial limb progress during the Civil War? Yeah, that's a great question. There was uh, immense um, artificial limb progress. So in a war that sees 60,000 amputations, uh, you better believe there's gonna be some innovation in that regard. Uh, in fact, one of the very first casualties of the Civil War was a Confederate soldier named, I think James was his first name, James Hanger. Um, he's killed, or sorry, he's uh, wounded, uh, has uh, a leg or maybe both, I think it's just one uh, leg amputated and he's, uh, he goes about devising a better prosthetic limb than existed at the time and he founds the Hanger Company which still exists today and still produces prosthetic limbs. Uh, so there's, there's immense progress that gets made, uh, you know, arms that kind of articulate and can lock in place, fingers that can move and lock in place, just all kinds of advancements along those lines. And actually this is a great opportunity to plug. We just had, thanks to our incredible members uh, and people that, that donated, we have three, uh, prosthetic limbs, Civil War era prosthetic limbs in our collection that we just had preserved and conserved and restored um, by a, a conservator. And we just got them back and they look great. And we're gonna be putting them out on display. We're getting a, a, a specialized display ready and we're gonna put them out uh, in April. And on April 16th, 
uh, here in the conference room, right below my feet, uh, we're going to have a, a special program with the conservator where we're going to talk about the history of the limbs, how they were preserved, and give you all a chance to, to get an up-close look at them. So that should be a really, really cool program. Um, so that, and that'll be in person uh, here. So we'd love to have you out if you can make it for that. Um, that'll be April 16th. Uh, any other questions um, in the comments, Michael? I think you've answered most of them. Let me see. I think there was one that I was holding off on. Well, and again, thank you to all of you for, for tuning in as Michael's uh, looking through that there. I uh, just want to say if, if you enjoyed the video, uh, hit the like button, share it. Uh, hit the share button, easy, free ways to help us out. Tell your friends uh, about uh, our videos. We usually do a, a program a week uh, that goes up. So uh, that's a way to support us and, and tell other folks about it. Uh, and then if you want to take your support to the next level, uh, please consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, for as low as $25 a year, uh, your membership dollars help uh, give us exciting technological capabilities to do this kind of two camera setup and, and, and all that. And if you just want to support us, uh, we'd certainly really appreciate it. Um, yes, do you find the question, Michael? I did, um, and it's a good one. I do like this one. So we all know about Dan Sickles and his leg and all that sure. jazz. So there was one question. It was by uh, Fernando Bastidas. Uh, says, were there any other famous amputated limbs that are kind of in storage apart from Dan Sickles? Sure. So Dan Sickles, for those that don't know, he was a uh, uh, major general at the Union Major General at the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, famously uh, wounded by an artillery shell, uh, one of these uh, strikes him in the leg. And he is carried off to a field hospital where he has his leg amputated, uh, and it winds up at the National Museum of Health and Medicine, uh, or the Army Medical Museum at the time. And uh, it's, it's sort of a one of the more famous limbs uh, in their collection. And after the war, and probably even before the war was over, he, there are reports that he would uh, go and visit the leg, um, which people mention often as sort of a curiosity. But what I think a lot of people don't know is that was actually quite common. If a Civil War soldier knew their leg was on display at the, the Army Medical Museum, quite a few people would actually go and visit their limbs. And in some cases, some of them were actually really upset that their limbs were displayed. Some of them wanted it back. Uh, but as the curators of the Army Medical Museum uh, said, uh, the rebuttal that they would often give is, uh, well, when you signed up to uh, join the war effort, uh, your leg here is still in service on display, and they uh, more often than not wouldn't uh, give the limbs back. So um, the leg of Dan Sickles, uh, which is not in our collection to be clear, it's in the collection of the Museum of Health and Medicines, um, that's definitely the most famous uh, of the Civil War limbs on display. I'm trying to think of any other kind of notable, uh, you know, amputations. Well, I guess Stonewall Jackson's arm is another kind of famous Civil War limb that was amputated, and it's buried separately from the rest of Stonewall Jackson. They're in two separate cemeteries. Um, so that's kind of uh, notable and interesting. Um, I'm trying to think of other, any other famous amputations. Um, the National Museum of Health and Medicine does have a lot of other famous little um, uh, medical bits, like they have a piece of um, uh, Garfield's spine, spinal cord near where he was shot. Um, and uh, one of my former colleagues, Jake Wynn, has a great video um, that he did about the assassination of President Garfield and how he, in some ways, was one of the last victims of Civil War medicine. It's a great program, highly encourage you to check that out. Um, so that they have a bit, bit of Garfield's spine. Uh, I think they have, um, you know, like a little uh, histology slide of um, General Ulysses S. Grant's uh, throat, um, like with throat, you know, his throat cancer and stuff. So they, they have other things that aren't kind of limb related, but, you know, interesting um, and anatomical stuff. Uh, yes, Michael. So there's two more. Um... I'll go, I think, the easier one to answer first from Randy Simon Saray. Um, she's asked this, I think it's she or she ran, has sent this three or four times, but I've been kind of holding off to the end. So did Dr. Letterman actually write a memoir during or after the war? Great question. Um, the short answer is no, unfortunately. Letterman actually retires uh, before the end of the war. So he emerges, he's put in a position of authority in August of 1862, uh, and he institutes all these changes 
and by uh, the beginning of 1864, uh, he's out. Uh, probably very tired. I can't imagine how stressful that sort of position was. He, he trained a very able successor, Thomas McParlin is the, uh, the gentleman's name that takes over for Letterman. And Letterman, uh, he writes, so I, I guess I was incorrect. He, do, he does write a memoir, it's called Medical Recollections, um, but it's not as long or as detailed as you would want it to be, and certainly as we would want it to be. And we just really don't have a lot of correspondence from Letterman. So we have some of his battle reports, which you can find in the medical and surgical history. And we have Medical Recollections, which is pretty good, but it's only, I think maybe like 100 pages or so. That is also available for free online. If you just Google Jonathan Letterman Medical Recollections, I think it was written in 1866, it should come up. So there is that, but it's, again, pretty brief. And he actually dies fairly early in life, um, in the early 1870s. He goes on to become the coroner, the coroner for the city of San Francisco, and he kind of lives the rest of his days in California. It's really kind of a curious end to a really incredible life. But we just don't have a lot of his letters, so we just don't know as much about him as we really wish we did. So that's, uh, that's the rest of the story there with Jonathan Letterman. We have a, a pretty good biography of him, uh, the best that I think probably can be done. It's called Surgeon in Blue, and I'm blanking on the author, but it is for sale in our bookshop. Um, and what was the other question, Michael? Um, if, 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 you, if you want to go into it, it's kind of somewhat off topic, but one of the, um, one, someone she asked where we got the um, amputation model. <laughs> yes, where did we get our, our limbs? That's a great question. Um, and I'll grab the whole one here. It's from a company out in uh, Washington State. Um, call, the company is literally called Sawbones. Um, and the purpose of these is basically uh, people that aren't us that buy these uh, are doctors in training. It's just kind of a very low stakes example of you know how to do a, a Civil War surgery with something that more or less kind of sort of resembles you know, human skin and bone, things like that. Uh, but it's always a great joy to get on the phone and be like, hey, we need, uh, we need a few more legs, <laughs> which uh, happens, you know, once or twice uh, uh, every year. But yes, it's from a company called Sawbones out in Washington State. And uh, if there are no other questions, um, we'll go ahead and, and close out here. Again, like and share the video and become a member. Uh, and Michael's... I got one more for you before more. we're... But before we're done, um, John McFarland just kind of asks, like, Letterman wanted, wanted to be Surgeon General, question mark? Uh, Letterman, you say? Yeah. Uh, no, Letterman never becomes Surgeon General. He, his highest uh, post was uh, Medical Director of the Army of the Potomac, so that is one of a handful of Union armies. Uh, and he reported to the Surgeon General, but he himself never became it. In, 1864, like I said, he leaves the army and makes for California, um, presumably quite exhausted. So that's, uh, that brings us to a close here. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, and we hope you tune in in the future. Uh, if you don't follow us on uh, Facebook or YouTube, that's where we're the most active. Uh, like, like our page and subscribe to us on YouTube to stay uh, the most up to date with all of our goings on. So we look forward to seeing you all next time and thanks so much for joining us today.